joining us to talk about that um, and her reaction also to the Batazi report is Jane Searle from Child Matters. Jane, good morning to you. Welcome to the show. Good morning, Michael. Um, that was the big thing to come out of the Batazi report at the end of the day was yet another from yet another child murder in this country, yet another investigation, and yet another systemic failing uh, being uncovered. But it was yet again mandatory reporting, um, you know, right up front, might have saved, would probably have saved in this particular case, Malachi. Is that your understanding I think that's as well? Exactly right. I think that's right. There's no doubt that if, if we have mandatory reporting and that if we'd got some other reports that that Malachi would be with us today. But having said that, this, we need to note the family did the right thing, his extended family, they did make reports of concern, <coughs> and the organisation that's charged with his well-being, Oranga Tamariki, failed him in every sense. But that is the, that is the, the main um, point to come out of this report. Everything else is predictable as it is frustrating, um, but I agree with all the recommendations, and that mandatory reporting one needs to be accepted. Now, um, I've just read out to my listeners this morning the view of... Um and, I, uh, and she's been quoted um, as a sort of an authority, University of Otago Associate Professor of Social Work, Emily Kettle, saying that requirements for mandatory reporting assume the problem is people knowing about abuse and not reporting it and that criminalising them would approve this. So obviously she's not in favour of it and neither, it seems, is the editorial of the Otago Daily Times today. What do you say to those people? I think that's completely flawed thinking. We know, and I've worked in this area for years, I was a child abuse detective and I've worked in the area of child abuse as have the team that I work with for years. And I can tell you that there were many, many investigations that I did when people knew what was happening, they either didn't know what to do or they weren't willing to do anything. So I think that is completely flawed and just not realistic. Um, nevertheless, that's the kind of advice that the government tends to get from its policy makers, uh, academics. Is I listen. I'm I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but is there a problem because so many of these victims, but also so many of these transgressors, are brown, and that so many of the policymakers dealing with this are white? Is there a trepidation of stepping into that area? No, I don't think it's that. I think that it is, um, there's a lot of resource that needs to be attached to this recommendation. And so this is not the first time that our governments have looked at this. This has happened under national governments as well. Successive governments have, as you said, kicked this king down the road. There is resource and planning and there's legislative change. And the other thing is that I don't think it's a huge vote getter, to be honest. So I definitely think that drives it. But we need to take the example of some of these other countries that have successfully implemented this. Really? You mean that you trying to save children's lives is not a vote get uh, a vote winner I don't think it is. I mean, we've seen that over years. This organisation's been around for about 30 years. And it's not a particularly popular thing with some politicians. And I don't think that it is, is actually an election issue. And my hope is that this time it will become more of an election issue. Well, it's funny you should say that. Because we are amongst the worst child killers per capita in the world, in the Western world anyhow. Um, we have reports of child abuse that are astronomical and our social workers can't deal with. Um, why are New Zealanders so indifferent to the suffering of our most vulnerable? Well, I think that it, it's linked... To, child abuse doesn't sit in isolation from other social issues. It's linked to our high methamphetamine use. It's linked to our high domestic violence rates. It's linked to a mental health system that's not coping and is completely broken as well. But on top of that, we have Oranga Tamariki that actually we know from this report, from the Ombudsman's report, from their own internal report that was released on the 29th of November. So three reports within a couple of months all identifying huge issues within that organisation. The culture, the uh, workloads, the training, the leadership. We've seen this for 30 years. And yet still as a country, we haven't had great calls to make those changes. Well, but Jane, can, I ask that question? can I just ask that question on uh, Te Aranga Tamariki, and it was formerly, as you know, mm. child, youth, family, etc. What's the problem? Surely those people go to work trying to save people's lives. Um, What's what 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 is the actual problem in that organisation? 
We need to get back to basics, Michael. That's what the problem is. Some of the social workers on the Ordang Tamariki are some of the best professionals I've ever worked with in my career, and they're absolutely committed. However, that organisation has been allowed leadership over the years, um, right from the top and from the politicians that have been in charge, that have allowed it to turn into an organisation that's just transactional with the families it works with. It has a, a what do you mean by that, that transactional? Has a bad culture. So they just, it's about statistics, it's about closing files, it's about high workloads and just getting through what they can, rather than that relationship building a good social work practice that we need. So these social workers are overworked, that's been identified in numerous reports over the years. Um, if you're overworked, if you're working in a toxic environment and you're not having the leadership and guidance you need, you're not going to be able to do the work you, d you need to do for vulnerable children. It's that simple, it's just basic organisational leadership. And we see this in Oranga Tamariki all the time. They're losing staff, hand over fist. Some sites are working quite well, some are not working well at all. And Oranga Tamariki admit this. The advisory board report released last year identified that for the minister. So some it's basics. We need to get back to allowing the staff to do core social work and not be changing policy every five minutes depending on what the government wants them to do and just get back to protecting children. It's that simple. They've got a massive vote. I'm looking at their annual budget. It's over $1 billion. So money shouldn't be the problem, should it? I think it's the implementation, and I think it's the way it's done in the leadership. So there's a lot that's changed, a lot of work that's done in Wellington, and none of it reaches the front line, which is the only thing that counts. So frontline workers tell me that nothing has changed in 15 years in that organisation but a name change. And uh, so when you think about that and the money we've spent on reports and reviews alone, I mean, Dame Karen in her latest report identified 33 reports and reviews that she found and she didn't think she'd found all of them. That's just an extraordinary waste of money and bureaucracy. Um, so we have to get back to the basics and we have to actually get some politicians who are willing to tackle the issue, make sure the resourcing is put where it needs to go. Um, and get the staff back doing what they need and want to do. Because if you look at this report, the social worker that was um, assigned the Malachi's case was a junior social worker that shouldn't have been able to make those calls on her own. That is the fault of the organisation. That's not the fault of the individual social worker. But often we've seen the social workers blamed, but it's not. It's the, it's the structure they're working in. Um, okay. But the other people that saw abuse were the early child care centre. Um, mm. and, and they saw it literally, the bruises. Um, did nothing about it, uh, made and and didn't report it um, to any authority. <laughs> I'm, we've tried to engage them, but obviously they're not talking to the media, and I don't even know if they're still in existence to this day. Actually, I think that might have been sort of that might have finished them off. But mm. would the any kind of mandatory reporting in that particular case require them legally to? with sanctions if they don't. What, a ringo so, rung the tamariki or the police? Yes, so what we're, what we're wanting is a system that has clearly legislates who is, who is a mandatory reporter, so there's no doubt, and which is what some countries overseas have got, and then is followed up by mandatory training. So in the UK, you cannot keep your teacher's um, certification unless you do training every few years on child protection, so your knowledge is up there. We don't have mandatory training in this country. We've been asking for it for years. Um, and so the only schools or teachers or early childhood centres that get trained is if they decide to get trained or if their school board of trustees gets them trained. There are many schools where these teachers have never had any training and they are the front line of protection, teachers and health workers. So again, it just comes down to a system that is falling behind the rest of the world and hasn't had the priority on it it should have. Jane, I have you on this program. I respect you. You have enormous credit credibility in terms of working in this area as a professional and now as an advocate. I don't see Children Matters getting as much um, media coverage as it should on an issue that I think goes to the heart of how um, healthy we are as a society. Um, why is that? Is that because people don't come to you or they know what you're going to say or is... Is it just because, yeah, you're saying something unfashionable? 
I think it is that, you know, child abuse exhibits the worst of human nature. As you rightly said um, before we spoke, this is, it's horrific and it's hard for people to comprehend how this happens. And so um, I think for a lot of people it's hard to engage with and we've seen that over many, many years that, you know, many years of me speaking to Rotary Clubs and other organisations, um, it is hard for, for people to engage that this is happening to children daily in this country. So we lose child, uh, since Malachi died, eight other children have died or we've been talking about how we're going to fix the system since then. Uh, Oranga Tamariki last year got 78,000 reports of concern. So these are huge, huge numbers. And it's confronting for New Zealanders to understand that this is what we're doing to our children. And I think that because it's difficult to engage with, that is the problem. I'm going to say to you, though, that, and I've got, got into trouble for it, I'm sure, as you're aware, for saying it, but I wonder if the problem isn't that um, if you really start probing into these deaths and maimings and tortures and um, non-accidental injuries, you start have to ask questions that, frankly, policymakers don't want to have to ask. Have I got some of that right? <laughs> 